Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Producing Dolby Atmos Music. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. I would now like to introduce Carrie Thomas. Carrie? Thanks so much. Uh, thanks all for being here today. Uh, this is the uh, second week of our webinar series for Dolby Atmos Music uh, Creation. Um, and uh, lots of exciting things to share with you today. So uh, thanks so much for joining. Um, one of the uh, one of the cool things that uh, that is constantly happening with uh, with Dolby Atmos is things are changing. Um, so we're going to give a quick update uh, on some uh, some new exciting announcements um, before I turn it over to uh, to Dave Way uh, to tell you some of, uh, of his experience with uh, with Dolby Atmos um, and uh, how he approaches some of the projects uh, that he's been uh, creating. Um, then we'll take a look at some guidelines for getting started and a workflow overview uh, focused around uh, Logic Pro um, uh, and some more advanced uh, operations with uh, uh, how it might also interact with uh, Logic coming into Pro Tools. So excited to, uh, to show you some of that. Uh, this week has been a pretty big week for us. Uh, uh, Apple Music on Monday announced that they would be distributing uh, Dolby Atmos Music uh, in their spatial audio uh, variety. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's really exciting. Uh, they listed thousands of tracks going to be available um, at uh, the service launch, which will be uh, in June. Um, and uh, very, uh, very eager to get you all working in, in Dolby Atmos um, and then uh, subsequently being able to deliver to, uh, to, to Apple as well as to our other partners. Um, and uh, there'll be an awful lot more information about this in the coming weeks and uh, certainly months. Um, so very, uh, uh, very excited by this. Uh, it's been, uh, uh, been a long time coming and uh, happy to be able to talk to you all about it. So. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, Mr. Dave Way. Uh, so Dave is a uh, multi Grammy Award winner based here in Los Angeles. Um, he's built in his uh, uh, in his Waystation studio a Dolby Atmos uh, rig, um, and he's really worked with a who's who of of artists and collaborators across uh, the the couple of decades that he's been uh, of, uh, working in uh, in in music. Uh, everyone from uh, Fiona Apple, uh, who he has a long-standing uh, uh, working relationship with, uh, to two of the Beatles, uh, Neil Young, uh, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson, um, and many, many more, uh, too numerous to, to actually list. In fact, couldn't even fit them in the notes section of my presentation here. Um, so David's been working in, in Dolby Atmos. He was nominated for the Immersive Grammy um, uh, the first year that it was uh, uh, actually the Immersive Grammy, following on from the surround, uh, for his work with A Bad Think. Uh, and Michael has, uh, has engaged him again with the release of his new album, uh, which is available for streaming uh, today, uh, as well as download uh, of that album from immersivealbum.com. So, I'm uh, going to allow Dave to talk to you. Uh, this was pre-recorded a couple of weeks ago, um, and I uh, um, hope you find this interesting. So uh, I certainly did. Dave Way, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for allowing us into your, your beautiful studio yeah, here sure. in, uh, in Beverly Hills, California. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into audio in the first place. How did I get into audio? Well, I was, you know, I was just a musician and a songwriter somewhat when I was a kid. Uh, played in bands and 
you know, kind of started making demos of the band and bouncing back and forth between two cassette machines and such like that. And, uh, you know, there, there was a point in my, I guess, you know, when I was about 19, 20 years old, I, I was, I wanted to be a baseball player and I was, I was actually pretty good, but I had to, you know, I was like either going to be a baseball player or do this music thing, as they said. And I kind of thought, I'm not really cut out to be a performer. I wasn't that good. I liked the songwriting, but I really liked the recording part of it. So I just kind of, a light bulb went off and, and I thought, you know, what if I kind of pursue this studio side of things? And, uh, and I did, I went to, ended up going to Berklee College of Music just when they started their recording program. And it was, it was meant to be, I guess, I, you know, it just uh, felt absolutely right when I got there and it just kept on that path. Here we are 30 years later. Cool. So you've been a pioneer all your career. You started the Berkeley program. <laughs> well, I had nothing to do with the start of it. They were nice enough to let me in, but yeah, uh, I was, I was, you know, happy. It was, it was, a, you know, cause as we know, the studio situation before that was just an apprenticeship kind of, uh, uh, model. And the idea of going to school to learn how to record, you know, uh, seemed crazy, at least to my parents, I think. But, as, you know, thankfully, Berkeley ha had a degree program. They were one of the few. So they liked it. As long as you get a degree, it's fine. So not that anybody's ever asked for my degree when, you know, they want me to mix a record. But, you know, uh, but yeah. And, uh, and, you know, then started in New York uh, and then did a couple of years uh, kind of getting my, you know, uh, getting my foundation and started working with a producer named Teddy Riley. It was kind of my break, breakout, uh, uh, you know, producer. He was just starting to be uh, super hot at the time. And also all of a sudden I was like working on big kind of big records that were getting a lot of attention and getting on the radio and stuff. So nice. that brought us out here to California to work with Michael Jackson in 91 that was and then uh i fell in love with california and uh been here since i i, I know that story so yeah that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> cool so um you're, you're you're here at the way station in uh way, way above the valley and uh you know kind of cresting the uh cre cresting into beverly hills here um how did you find yourself in in this you know, beautiful location uh, you know, it's funny when, when we came out here to, to work on that Michael Jackson record, we were working, uh, we were working at record one, which is right down on Ventura Boulevard. That's where we started. Then we ended up moving to Larrabee, which is the Larrabee we know now on, on Lancashire. And then we were staying at the Universal Hilton. So every day I would drive from the Universal Hilton to, to record one or, and then later, but, uh, Larrabee. But I remember the first time I, somebody took me through Laurel Canyon. And as soon as I went through Laurel Canyon, I was like, what is this? Where, where is this? What's this called? <laughs> and, and I was like, I really like it here. This has got a cool vibe. And so I, I, the first house I had, the first place I had uh, when I moved here was in Laurel Canyon. And uh, I loved it there. And, and then as you do, as you get older, you move a little more uh -huh. <laughs> westward in the canyon situation. So, uh, no, I've been here about uh, 25 years. Nice. I, I built the studio about 20 years ago when my daughter was born, 18 years ago, because she's 18. Fantastic. And uh, I've pretty much been working here ever since. That's great. It's yeah. The studio's made some changes. At first, there was a big SSL in here, like a 6000 E-Series. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, about seven or eight years ago, I, I m made the transition into the, into the box, basically, a uh, very long-considered transition but i have absolutely no regrets about it it's been the best thing and then recently uh the biggest upgrade is for atmos obviously fantastic yeah, yeah and when we when we first started talking about dolby atmos you know i i came up and i visited and uh you know saw all this beautiful outboard gear that you have uh here. yeah like, yeah okay need to do something special and something you know a little little little, little different than just you know in in the box with pro tools and uh uh, so we came up with a beautiful focus right solution that's, uh, yep. Focus rights have been great right there. Uh, -huh. uh, there's an avid S4 console and, uh, my favorite KRK V series, cool. uh, monitors. We've got a 7.1.4, uh, 
uh, array, and uh, it sounded great. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's 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 certainly a special place to be, and to hear the music that's that's coming out of here is, is just fantastic. Oh, you know, good. I'm love glad. the Aloha Hawaii. Love the bad thing. Cool. Uh, great. great. Great to hear it. I like hearing that. I want to hear even more stuff out there in Atmos. Uh, it's yeah. like it's my favorite part of the of the week now when I get to spread it out. Fantastic. Then when I go back to stereo, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about Bad Think. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was the first record you did up here uh, after your installation. Um, yes, first mix. Yeah, in Atmos here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you were tracking that somewhere else. We tracked uh, most of it. Well, it starts uh, Michael Marquardt, the artist mm -hmm. of a Bad Think. It's basically him. Um, he'll he'll start with. Uh, he has a beautiful studio. He's got a couple of beautiful studios, and he also has Windmark Studios, which is another great, uh, you know, recording studio here in Santa Monica. But uh, but he starts recording himself just like vocal, and for this album, we intentionally left it very sparse. His, his kind of skeleton tracks that you always have basically a keeper vocal, mm -hmm. maybe some harmonies and stuff, some guide or or, or, or you know basic guitars and some keyboards and maybe just a simple drum beat that's given us the idea of what the groove is, where the groove is. And then, uh, so once we had all the songs in that shape, then we went over to Henson Studios and Studio D back there and uh, had Jeremy Stacy, the drummer from King Crimson and many other recording sessions, uh, studio sessions, and Sean Hurley, the bass player, uh, both of them fantastic. And Victor Andrizo actually came and played some additional drums. We had a couple of songs where there were double drums happening. Um, but we set up everything in, in, at Henson with all kinds of mics all around the room, <laughs> uh, binaural heads and uh, lots of other, you know, the Sennheiser Ambio and other room mics everywhere to kind of capture the whole, you know, the bigness of that room, which is actually a great sounding room. And um, so that was the bass, you know, the drums and bass there. Then we came back here, did some more overdubs, uh, guitars mostly. We sent uh, keyboard stuff out to our friend Phil Chanal, who mm has -hmm. worked with Michael on his last few records. And uh, he's great. He's got his own studio. So he, we just send him the tracks as they are. And then he puts his magic on, sends me back the stems. And then it was, uh, for the most part, then pretty much time to mix. And so I had just gotten the room started here and uh, got it. I, I, I took about four or five songs where, you know, at first <laughs> took me a bit to get used to the idea that I can't check out any other monitors. I have one set of monitors because I'm, I'm usually the guy who has four or five, maybe even more speakers that I'm checking constantly. Yeah. And then I go to the car and then I go to the living room and I check it on my phone. Um, but this was one speaker, uh, system. And on top of that, I didn't really have any other Atmos mixes to reference. Right. Uh, I had fantastic Negrito, which <laughs> yeah. I was able to get because, uh, Xavier, the artist is a friend of mine and uh -huh. he said, Oh, you can have that. So, <laughs> so I listened to that album quite a bit, but, um, then I, uh, so I was, felt a bit flying blind at first and so I took after about four or five songs went over to Capitol uh, and Steve Jenowick was there and Steve's been instrumental in helping me kind of get my you know get myself settled in the Atmos situation he's he's helped me avoid a lot of mistakes and and you know uh, uh, potholes along the way so um, so we went over there had a listen the, came to the conclusion that I could make a couple of adjustments here that would help. And uh, so I did. We moved the speakers around a bit, retuned it again. And uh, and then I, I got a, a, a Dolby decoder system so I could start streaming stuff in Tidal and actually listen to other people's <laughs> Atmos mixes. And that was a big help also now because now I was super inspired by hearing all the different uh, you know kinds of approaches that people are taking. And um, so... Then, by, by after I got into the you know the the mixes again at that point, then I started to really kind of feel more comfortable, cool. and yeah, 
and uh, and continue to do that. You know, <laughs> every project's a little different. Yeah. So, you know, take, taking those uh, uh, initial tracks that uh, that Michael provided you, um, what was the what was the inspiration then to uh, to capture more at Henson? What, was there anything you particularly wanted to to achieve uh, with the Atmos version versus the stereo? Well, it's funny because you know, when when we were recording, I still hadn't mixed anything in Atmos yet. I had recorded this Hawaiian album. Uh, just, uh, I think, just a couple of weeks before we actually were recording Michael's drums and, and bass and stuff at Henson, but I hadn't mixed it yet. So my idea of what mixing in Atmos would be when I was recording was actually a little different than what ended up, I, I found, to be the case when I actually sat down right. to do the mixes. It wasn't exactly as I maybe planned or, th or, or, or thought, even though it is this big 360 playground that you can kind of do anything you want, there are still some rules and, um, not rules, but, you know, um, there's, there are things that just work that um, at least I've found, you know, different kinds of music tend to require different types of approaches, you know, and it seems to me the rock band kind of thing, which bad think is yeah. uh, you know it's basically still just bass drums guitars and keyboards even though there's a lot of ear candy and stuff it's still the foundation of it is mm -hmm. the the band so i did find that we still wanted to basically have that foundational stuff in the front right and then it's all the decorative stuff behind whereas i think when i was recording it i thought oh the drums are going to be everywhere they're going to be in the back and they're going to be up in the, in the ceiling or whatever you know but uh you know i did kind of start to find out oh, okay this works better this doesn't work right yeah yeah i mean it, it, it's, it's like the things that are natural and the things that are you uh, expected are the yeah things that work, you and know? well you know one of the one of the things that i I st still hope and I still look for music where it, it can work is to really break away from the kind of front loaded um, experience that we're, we've been used to forever. Cause that's what we've all grown up listening to, you know, outside of headphones, we listen to speakers that are whatever, 10 feet in front of us and stuff. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard to break your your routine from that, right. but I, when there's opportunities to do that, I, I really look for them. Yeah. And what do, what do you what do you think has been really successful in in those things that you've looked for? Is there anything you you kind of highlight as your one go to? Like, oh my God, this is the, the thing that works great. Uh, well, I mean, just kind of generally, um, as far as the height speakers go, it seems that the you know, things with a lot of high-end information seem to really carry best into the height speakers. Um, and I kind of thought that even before I started mixing in Atmos. I, I you know, uh, even just going to movies and seeing what they were choosing to go with. But, it, but I think since our ears are so used to um, uh, identifying things more so from high-end information, which is more localized, it really, you know, th when things are... are uh, kind of the more high-end information above us, your, your, your ear really latches onto it. Um, but yeah, you know, um, trying to find the places where the bass can sit, sometimes it wants to be more front-loaded, and I think a lot of that has to do with, for the most part, subwoofers tend to be in the front of the room. Mm -hmm. So um, even if bass frequencies aren't so directional, you still, they, you still feel it more from the front. Um, but, um, you know, drums, when it's a drum kit, still seem to need to be um, one unit and right. you can find a place, but generally, like I said, if it's a rock band, you don't, you know, you don't necessarily feel like the drummer's in the back of the room and the bass player's in the front of the room and vice versa. Though, you know, when I did this Hawaiian album, I recorded it, uh, basically everybody in a circle and uh, no headphones and basically just recreate, you know, had uh, a lot of mics in the middle of the room and then mics along the outsides and uh, some above and basically just tried to recreate that 
space in the mix. And so, but that was almost like a jazz record, really. So, um, and because it was recorded that way, because I, you know, even before recording was thinking about where the pannings of everything is going to be, mm-hmm. that's something you really only consider when you're mixing, when you're mixing in stereo, you're not really thinking too much about the, the, the panning positions of things as you're recording them. That's something, you know, you kind of decide, uh, you know, you have, you don't have too many options. In this case, I spend so much time now thinking about where to pan things, you know, so (laughs) we have so much space. Yeah. Well, so uh, you've got a a wall lined with platinum records over here. You've been very successful in your, in your career and, uh, you know, with a wide variety of artists. Um, I'm thankful for that. I get to do all kinds of different projects. Yeah. Seeing everything from Christina Aguilera to Macy Gray to Sheryl Crow, you mentioned uh, yeah. uh, Michael Jackson. Uh, I know you have a longstanding relationship with Fiona Apple as well. Yeah, um, sure. And you know, do you find do you think that you know if you were working with those artists again, you you might approach things in a different way, think about. Producing oh yeah, I've already put the I planted the seeds for Atmos albums down the road, and if not going back into the catalog for sure on on. On those artists, and and for the most part, I'm, you know, uh, I'm I'm going into most projects, especially if I'm recording them. I was just uh, recording a John Doe folk trio album uh, in Austin a couple of weeks ago, and you know, we, I, I told them they hadn't even heard Atmos yet, but I said we're gonna do it in Atmos. I'm just telling <laughs> you that right now, and they're okay, fine. I, I can't wait to hear it, you know. So, um, so I, I you know, I, I'm certainly it's it's always on my mind now. Whenever I'm recording, I'm thinking in Atmos now. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, that 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 that's great to hear. Uh, obviously for for my career, uh, but also for <laughs> mine too. For, all of ours. I mean, it's an exciting progression. You know, I mean, I haven't been this excited about a new technology, a new because um, it, it's really a, it's a different way of hearing things and and presenting things. You know, it's a, it's a radical difference and and the end user really i've i've had so many people come up here who haven't heard anything in atmos and i played them some things and you know the reaction is the same almost every time where it's just like whoa wow and they get goosebumps and they feel it on an emotional level that's different and and you know elevated from the stereo experience so um and you know as soon as I'm done playing five or six songs, they're like, well, how do I get this? What do I do? You know, what do we do on the next album? What do we do? You know, and then you start to see all the, the gears turning and the, you know, excitement. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's always fun to hear somebody say, if I knew about this, when I was. Recording. Yeah, exactly. You want to go back, you, you know, you want to re-record everything uh-huh. or remix everything. Yeah. So, but thankfully that's exactly what's been happening with, classic records that we've you know there's so many things on title now and 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 other streaming services so you know it's it's uh it's a really amazing thing to hear records that you thought you knew and hear them in a whole new light again yeah yeah so uh you mentioned uh listening in the car very briefly before uh when you you yeah 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 we actually got the opportunity to do that a couple of weeks ago um you know i sent you in the yeah uh, the atmos enabled uh uh prototype vehicle that's uh that that we uh that that dolby proof of concepted yeah what was that experience like? oh it's great i mean that's another thing that as soon as you get into it you realize oh the car is going to be the perfect place for this because we have a roof right over our heads, and uh, unless you're in a convertible, I guess convertibles don't work so well for Atmos. But um, yeah, yeah. Different, different kind of atmos, different yeah. kind of Atmos. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it works great. I mean, and I, I see that as being a big thing, you know, coming down the road, Wonderful. down the road. Oh, <laughs> see what I did there? I see what you did there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm I'm excited to, uh, to to see that happen as well. Yeah. Um, and you know, content is the king, as they always say. Yeah. And so we'd be we'd be nothing in this in this industry without folks like yourself. Yeah, and and us. and music, you know, you got it. Yeah, that's the thing that is connecting all of us. So you know, it's without the music, there's there's nothing there. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's certainly the reason that I'm I'm passionate about Atmos is is you know the the experience that you have with somebody is, and is, is something you feel versus. Yeah, uh, something you hear. And, you really, uh, you really do feel it in a different way. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it gets your whole body in a, in a way that stereo just doesn't. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Well, I'm sure we'll talk much, much more, um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll continue to hear wonderful things from you. But thank you so much for taking the time to thank to, you to spend with me today um, and uh, to answer some questions and for being such a wonderful advocate in the in the marketplace. Oh yeah, I'm happy to talk about Atmos anytime. Wonderful. Well, Thanks, Kerry. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dave Way. Um, you know, great, uh, uh, great advocate, and uh, you know, fantastic, uh, fantastic partner in uh, in content creation. And truly, look forward to, uh, uh, to to spending more and more time with Dave as uh, as things go, uh, go 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 forward here. Um, so, wanted to to spend some time giving you uh, a little bit of a, a rundown of some of the uh, the opportunities that uh, that exist. Uh, here and uh, some guidelines for for getting started in uh, in Dolby Atmos music. Um, so Dave kind of mentioned uh, this in, in in passing, but uh, you know, keep it simple. Um, so Dolby uh, Dolby Atmos is a it, it's a it's an enveloping, it's an immersive format. Um, but the, the 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 most effective use of the of the experience is actually by keeping things simple. Um, so one of the uh, one of the conversations I've had in recent weeks, as with an engineer who uh, who pointed out that actually you know you stand outside in, in 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 nature in the city you know wherever you might be, um, and we get aeroplanes going on overhead all the time. It's only when something changes that uh, you uh, you kind of uh, um, uh, allow you to uh, to give. Uh, to, 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 to really pull that out. So keep it simple, make it very, uh, you know, make it very pointed, use movement sparingly. So if you're flying things around um, uh, constantly, uh, the brain is gonna shut them off. So allow these, uh, these moments, these key moments to uh, penetrate the experience um, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get a much more effective uh, immersive experience. Um, so uh, think tomberly. So Dave mentioned a couple of times uh, there, you know, that you know, working in stereo, you were used to things uh, being in certain locations, low frequency drums at the front of the uh, front of the room, uh, but also that high frequencies are represented better overhead. That's true whether you're working in in headphones or in speakers, um, and really allow the the track to guide you. Um, and uh, to to get you know your your point across, allow the song to tell you where uh, where those those characteristics need to be. Um, and mono is your friend. Um, you know stereo has, has has been great, and you know of course that's uh, that's continuing to be uh, a, a a a massive platform. Um, but in terms of you know the the true elements that are underlying, mono is is often a good place to be. Um, it allows you to very accurately position and uh, and create uh, those uh, those key moments, um, and we'll look at some of that in just a moment here. So, how do you um, uh, how do you actually create this? Um, so, uh, with uh, the, the digital audio workstations in market today, uh, we have support built in uh, with Steinberg Steinberg Nuendo uh, and with Avid Pro Tools. Uh, as well as the uh, the sort of more post-focused tools of Blackmagic Design. So this is the foundation that we're building off of for Adobe Atmos content creation. Um, and you know, one of the things we we, we talked about uh, earlier is you know obviously Apple uh, with their um, Atmos Music um, uh, you know, capability, uh, and they have their Logic platform. We're actually going to be taking a look at the, some of that today, um, and Ableton. We won't get time to look at Ableton, uh, but the workflows and the concepts are very similar between Logic and, uh, and Ableton. Uh, so we'll cover some of that. So what does the workflow actually look like? Well, this um, uh, this the, the, this will be a live demonstration, so uh, wish me luck. Um, but it's based around the Dolby Atmos production suite in this instance. Um, so the Dolby Atmos production suite is the renderer um, that takes uh, all of the audio and all of the metadata um, that is generated by the music panner um, in, into uh, this, this, this software application. 
um, it's capable of running on on headphones, um, and uh, this this will allow you to work just on a laptop. Any headphones, the binauralization is done in the renderer, um, and allow you to get that sense of space and uh, and, and positioning. It also has a number of speaker modes, uh, so from 2.0, uh, which you'll see in my renderer here, right the way up to get actually the channel counts for 30 something odd channels in the in the home theater renderer um, uh, that's all all possible too and feeding into that I uh, will be showing you logic pro so logic pro uh, with the Dolby uh, audio bridge uh, is a core audio device that can feed out 130 channels into the renderer um, and the metadata controls associated to that are generated by the uh, Dolby Atmos music panel um, I'll let also step in and, and show you know one of the workflows that we utilized with uh, with Jacob Collier um, when he came into uh, Capital Studios uh, during the Grammys um, to uh, finalize his track All I Need uh, in Dolby Atmos um, where we actually recorded the automation that he generated in, in Logic uh, with his engineer Ben Bloomberg um, and put that into Avid Pro Tools uh, to then send across to Emily Lazar who was going to master it uh, uh, for release. Um, we'll hear from Emily in week four of the webinar, uh, talking about her process for, for mastering uh, Dolby Atmos, um, and uh, it's better for, for them to tell you than me to tell you. So the Dolby Atmos Music Panner is available for audio units, uh, AAX and VST. Uh, it is Mac only, um, but includes a step sequencer that you can see there. Um, that allows you for uh, to do uh, uh, synchronize to, to workstations tempos um, and uh, some you know to find some predefined uh, pan shapes. So without further ado, let's just let me uh, take this off of my webinar mode and uh, wish me luck. So here in Logic. Um, which I hope you can see. Um, we've got um, uh, the, 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 the creation, uh, very simple track here. You're not actually gonna hear it, nobody wants to hear it, um, but it's going to feed into the, uh, the Dolby Atmos renderer. So the Dolby Atmos renderer, as I mentioned, is set up uh, in our preferences here to use the Dolby Audio Bridge uh, I'm outputting to the uh, Scarlett uh, interface from Focusrite um, and uh, working with the headphones in binaural mode. Um, there is actually a headphone only mode, which we could also enable, um, but uh, I wanted to show all of the meters here. So we've got the audio bed, the, the 7.1.2 bed configuration plus audio objects. Um, and this is uh, going to uh, uh, be where all of the audio data gets generated for, uh, for our session. So in Logic, uh, again, if we open up our preferences file here, we'll see uh, the audio preferences feeding out of the uh, Dolby Audio Bridge. And what I've created is an IO configuration, which is set up as 714 in the 3 slash 4.1 um, uh, configuration, and that's in left, right, center, sub, left side, right side, left rear, right rear. Um, any uh, elevation that we're going to put into this uh, mix is going to be as uh, part of audio objects, um, so uh, that's not represented in the bed configuration here. In Pro Tools, uh, in Nuendo, that's built in, um, so you can actually generate uh, 712 content directly with uh, with those those panners. Um, so, in Logic, uh, you know, or in any workstation, actually, um, the the interaction between the uh, the, the panner um, here we we see that those are connected to 11 and 12 uh, is going to match up to the outputs. Um, uh, so the outputs here, 11 and 12, are uh, hitting um, into the into the renderer. So if I was to uh, just click here and uh, uh, position, oh, it's not showing for some reason. Um, I know why. I've got Pro Tools open as well. <laughs> uh, 
So I'm gonna put that into automation mode, uh, switch back to my logic. Um, so here I should be able to um, uh, you know, hit play and we'll see in the, in the uh, in, in Pro Tools here, we'll see that uh, actually moving theoretically. <laughs> For some reason, it's not doing that. Um, but you can see that actually the representation here is for uh, you know audio to be to be placed and, and to be moving. So these are matched pairs. So we've got the panner associated to the uh, output path that's going to control the experience for. Um, uh, actually, that was never automated. So that's why that was not working. Um, so we've got you know ch channels 11 and 12 that are going to represent that. Um, as we mentioned, uh, mono is your friend. So here I've got a stereo track, um, but uh, I wanted it to be located uh, in the rear of the room. Um, and while this is a, a base uh, base band, uh, a, a, a low frequency uh, content, it's got some high frequency elements to it. So I'm using this just to give a, an impact behind me. Um, and, uh, and and playing that out. So you'll see that there's you know, static elements. We're use, utilizing the uh, the bed configuration for this organ uh, that's feeding the, the 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 bed channels, and then some individual elements that are moving very uh, um, uh, limited fashion uh, to uh, to give that impact. So really, you know, utilize the sound field. To paint a picture of what your what your track needs to tell uh, the, the story your track needs to tell. Um, so this workflow is the same where um, uh, where you're where you're, where you're talk, talking whether it, it's in Logic in Ableton um, in uh, any of the other workstations that exist for uh, for Mac OS, um, uh, and if you're a Windows based user. Then you can also utilize that with uh, an external uh, renderer. Um, so we have the Mastering Suite solution. We'll cover more about that, those workflows next week, um, and some of the options that are available for that. So um, the renderer can sit on a Mac or PC, um, and so uh, that is what is going on there. Um, so I mentioned this extended workflow. Uh, so in uh, in Pro Tools, um, uh, which I should find here, there we go. So in Pro Tools, um, there's a functionality that exists to uh, utilize recorder mode. So this is something that exists for uh, for, for, for the cinema uh, workflows. Um, but in the uh, built-in uh, panner for Pro Tools, I've connected up using my, uh, using my Dolby Atmos connection, and I'm going to link object and audio recording. And what this is going to allow me to do is when I go into play in my uh, uh, in my, my logic session here, it's actually going to enable me to monitor all of that audio. But then if I was to roll the timeline, I can actually punch in and get all of that automation and audio dumped into, into Pro Tools. Um, so this allows you to utilize um, some, you know, if you're working with a producer or engineer who's us using another workstation, you can actually dump this uh, automation directly into Pro Tools and uh, then uh, do, do all of that work. You don't have to use Pro Tools to do that. Um, you can create this all within Logic um, and into, into the renderer directly, but it's a useful workflow if you're collaborating with others to be able to, to achieve that. Um, so uh, in terms of the, 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 the functionality of the, uh, of the music panners and, and things like that, we can, we can dive in much more detail next week where I don't have a 20 minute video associated to, uh, uh, to, to the storytelling, um, but, um, uh, and there's lots of resources available on uh, our professional.dolby.com site. And those are expanding every single day. So uh, very excited to uh, um, uh, continue that expansion and to help you uh, all create uh, content in, in Dolby Atmos. Uh, before we open up the, the floor to Q&A, 
again, those, these resources are available uh, on the uh, quick start guides and things. So getting started with Ableton Live is linked uh, from the uh, professional.w.com site. Um, and uh, that will enable you to, to get up and running. It's also a whole bunch of good resources uh, in terms of getting your studio set up, as well as uh, you know, how you might want to uh, create your, your, your Atmos setup in your room. Studio enablement is there to, to facilitate that, um, and then also to get the message out about your studio being enabled for Dolby Atmos. Um, and many, many more resources are available to, uh, to, to, to you as you go forward. Uh, so next week, we're going to take a look at uh, some of those design principles um, and uh, you know, working with uh, you know, the, the different manufacturers, uh, speaker manufacturers, some choices that can be made um, to, to create uh, this, this, this workflow um, uh, uh, for, for Dolby Atmos. Highly customizable, um, and uh, so the team is here to help you get, get to that. But we'll cover a couple of options uh, next week. And then in the final week of this series, uh, a conversation uh, between Emily Lazar and Michael Romanowski. Uh, you heard Xavier, fantastic Negrito, mentioned in Dave Way's uh, interview there. Uh, Michael Romanowski was the mastering engineer for that project, um, as well as many others in the immersive uh, category. Um, and so uh, he, alongside of Emily, who worked with Jacob Collier on All I Need and other tracks, as well as a vast variety of, uh, of, of catalog titles from the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. Um, uh, they'll be sharing their knowledge about mastering in Dolby Atmos um, and uh, where they think the technology can go. So great conversation. Uh, join me for join me for that. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to open the floor to to Q and A's because I see them uh, see them coming in here. Um, so I see uh, a a, a, a a bunch of uh, questions from from somebody SDF SDFS. Um, I uh, I apologise for not calling you out by name, but um, uh, uh, going to answer some of your questions here. Um, so just want to point out that on the on the screen there, there's a um, uh, there's a, a, a download 90 day trial of the production suite that can be associated to um, uh, to, to to help you create uh, Adobe Atmos. So get started there. Um, how do you listen to the binaural render within Pro Tools? Uh, do you need to sync? Uh, uh, do you need to sync the Dolby Atmos renderer app through LTC, or is there an AX Atmos to binaural monitor plugin? Uh, all of the monitoring uh, is done in in the renderer. So there's two pathways into the renderer for Pro Tools: um, the send and return plugins, uh, which would in fact send the uh, the binaural back into Pro Tools, um, but it, all of the binauralization is occurring in the renderer. Uh, for that, um, so it's just PCM passing back in. Uh, so you can use that workflow, or you can use the Dolby Audio Bridge into the renderer in the same way that we 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 just explored with um, uh, with Logic, and then all of the binauralization is occurring in that and uh, recording out or passing out into the uh, into the headphone outputs that you de you define. Um, so uh, that's, uh, is the HRTF uh, the same? Um, so I'm not going to get into the specifics of what, uh, what what our partners are doing on their uh, on their creation and playback side, um, but uh, the HRTF that's used um, and the room models that are used in the renderer um, are. Uh, what then feed into our Dolby AC4 IMS codec that's available for uh, uh, playback on Tidal. Um, and uh, the, the experience in the renderer is what you should hear um, over speakers and then over headphones in, uh, in all of our partners. That's what we strive for, being very close to, to those uh, creation mechanisms. Uh, will the Dolby Panner plugin work in Studio One Professional 5? Um, I don't know uh, specifically about Studio One, um, but uh, we've had great success on um, a wide variety of platforms on, um, on again, certainly on the Mac, um, uh, Cubase included, so Cubase uh, ho ho hosting the VST um, or audio units plugin and feeding out, 
Steinberg have decided that, uh, that Nuendo is their pathway there, um, and uh, that's how we work with all of our manufacturers. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it may, it, your mileage may, will vary, uh, might, may vary, um, but uh, certainly happy to, uh, to help with any uh, challenges you have. Uh, what decoder is Dave Way using to decode Tidal into his uh, Focusrite system? Uh, so Dave is actually uh, using a, a home theater receiver. Um, uh, I, I believe it's the Morant um, or a Morant uh, preamp uh, version, um, but uh, I would have to double and triple check that. But he's feeding that out into the um, into the Focusrite A16, uh, which is doing the uh, analog to Dante conversion. Uh, to go into his uh, into his speaker system, so uh, very uh, easy and flexible to to do that. Um, so, question here about explaining in detail about how to bring all information from one workstation to another. Um, so, we're going to cover that in in more detail uh, next week. But essentially, it's um, uh, any audio that passes out of one workstation. Um, uh, along with the metadata, so the, the PAN metadata, assuming the other workstation, so Pro Tools in this example, uh, has a recorder mode to grab the inf grab the metadata as it passes through. This is something that has happened in, in post-production for the last, what are we now, nine, ten years, um, and uh, so is, is now applicable in music as well. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very... Uh, uh, very much deeply integrated into the the communication uh, libraries that exist for for Dolby Atmos. So there's that. Um, can you talk about the best way to take stereo channels back into the mono world? Um, so the, the best way is is you know frankly what sounds right to you. Um, so there are a number of me methods uh, to do that. Obviously you can you can fold those uh, channels down into uh, into mono. Um, or as I was doing in that um, uh, in that particular example, um, use, use, like, using the copy uh, methodology um, in the exp in the in the panner to uh, sum the movements um, and allow the uh, allow the renderer to to do that uh, controlled uh, 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 fold down for you. Um, so uh, you know I, I would. Absolutely encourage you to uh, to figure out if if it's actually uh, stereo or if it's dual mono uh, masquerading as stereo um, or if it's uh, a stereo signal. Um, but then it's going to be a case of uh, figuring out what that down mix uh, is is most effective with for you. Um, uh, I noticed you had the sync in MTC when using Logic. Is there a reason for that? Um, so, uh, in in Logic, um, uh, I find that the the MIDI timecode generator is is very accurate and uh, um, uh, and consistent, and certainly allows for uh, much easier uh, configuration than uh, than working with uh, LTC in that platform uh, right now. So. Uh, I haven't yet found a uh, an LTC generator that uh, um, I'm 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 particularly happy recommending. Uh, so uh, MTC is the way I go with that. Um, if you're stuck with being in PC, can you use the new Endo renderer to take care of all that needs to produce Atmos content? Um, so uh, I'm going to say yes and no. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely, the built-in renderer in the Endo. Uh, will allow you to, uh, to to pan, to create, and then to export um, uh, a Dolby Atmos uh, ADM. Uh, it will also allow you to set binaural metadata that will be useful for the the encodes that would go to uh, to some of our partners. Um, what it doesn't allow you today is uh, to actually monitor that uh, that binaural signal. Um, so it is worth uh, creating the uh, the master file. And then taking it and putting it onto a um, uh, a Mac production suite, if you can, um, if you have that available, uh, to monitor that binaural uh, render. Or if you're connected to a, a second machine, mastering suite style, then uh, make sure to monitor the um, uh, 
uh, the binaural path on that. Um, <clears throat> so I've done that one. Um, we're excited to learn more from engineers, the tracking, overdubbing with the intention of mixing for Atmos. Uh, Dave Way alluded to some things that he did to capture more microphones in his tracking sessions, but I'm wondering if he planned to offer more webinars in the near future. Well, uh, Graham, the good, uh, good, good, good news is that a bunch of that has been covered in previous webinar sessions. Um, so uh, I'd highly recommend you uh, uh, seek out on our website, professional.dolby.com uh, slash music, uh, our previous webinar sessions, in particular working uh, with uh, Steve Jenowick, who Dave Way mentioned. Uh, Steve uh, has uh, spent a long time working in, in Dolby Atmos and uh, a lot of the recording uh, work that, uh, that he's done will give you a good guidance of that. And he talks about that in a session we did um, in my head. It was last uh, August or September, um, but uh, my head is a little screwy. It's been a bit busy year. Um, what are the constraints on mixing with tracks that were not recorded for Atmos versus those that were? Um, really interesting question. So we've had, um, uh, or I say we, you know, the industry um, is, is, is who I'm always talking about when it comes to we in that sense. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, our, our partners at, at Universal Music Group, at Warner Music Group, and uh, across the, the indie ecos ecosystem have worked on a wide variety of content. Um, now, some of that uh, content was thought of for Atmos in the first instance, or you know, at least very soon along the way as they've developed that frontline catalog. Others are decades old that weren't. Um, so at that point, you know, I, I mentioned you know, allowing the music to guide you. Um, one of the, well, in fact, the earliest Atmos mix for music was Elton John's Rocket Man. Um, and uh, I got the opportunity to talk with, uh, with the original engineer for that this week and he said how, uh, how, how blown away he was by that experience um, but um, what Greg uh, Penny who, uh, who was the producer on that immersive experience um, uh, did was allow the tracks to guide him so uh, the the sort of bed configuration in that was you know here's the song as it exists right Elton is is, is available uh, and you know, sit, sit, sitting at the front of the room uh, playing his piano. But then there's these uh, ARP uh, pieces that uh, kind of are perfect for sitting um, uh, and, 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 and positioning in, in space. Um, and so the music was guiding him. So as the, uh, as the rocket takes off, the slide guitar comes up over your head. So getting back to those original elements, uh, in that in that instance, it was a 16-track Dolby A encoded tape. Um, you know, allowed the engineer to explore those things, but really maintained the uh, the existence of and the essence of the of the of the track as it existed. So very cool. Um, assuming we have a capable processor, does Blu-ray have the capability to be rendered to the full Atmos spec of 30 plus channels? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the decoder that's available in um, uh, in uh, in consumer devices uh, is uh, going to take the Atmos bitstream and render it to the best uh, possible uh, uh, speaker layout um, that's available. Uh, for example, uh, this year uh, in the Groningen Museum in Amsterdam, uh, the Rolling Stones had their unzipped exhibit. Uh, and that was mixed Capital Studios uh, uh, for that exhibit, um, and the DD Plus Jock uh, file that is going to play on, um, uh, on on the streaming services is actually being used there. And it's passing into a Trinov uh, Altitude 32 uh, setup and decoding to 26 speakers in that uh, experience. Um, so whether you're, you're playing that mix over a soundbar. Uh, an echo studio or out into uh, into something that large it's just one single mix uh, so the ADM file that gets created in the renderer um, is also capable of encoding to blu-ray 
Um, so, uh, and utilizing the True HD codec, which is our lossless codec um, for, uh, for, for, for Blu-ray authoring and, uh, and going out into the world. Um, logic talking to production suite, talking to Pro Tools info, is that on professional.dolby.com? Not yet. Um, I, uh, I, in fact, shot the video for it earlier today, so uh, watch this space. It will, uh, it will go up there uh, pretty soon, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, so uh, very eager to uh, to get that out into the world. Um, any recommendations for conversion of third order ambisonic mixes to Atmos beds? Um, so with third order ambisonics, I'd, 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 I'd encourage you probably not to go into the Atmos bed. Um, so uh, decoding into uh, you know, using something like HarpX uh, is going to give you the most flexibility. So if you take a third order ambisonic uh, or a you know, first or second order ambisonic signal and feed it into uh, one of the ambisonic decoders, um, use the output channels from that as source for object locations. So if you look at one of the uh, webinars where Nick Reeves, uh, in fact, the South by Southwest presentation, Nick Reeves talks about the object bed. If you're going to create something like that, um, then it's going to allow you to decode and maintain the resolution that's available in something like a third order ambisonic. Um, we'd, we'd hate to crash that down into a, in, into a 712 uh, and limit all of the, uh, all of the resolution that, uh, that you gain with that, with that format. <clears throat> uh, is there any advantage to using the send and return method as opposed to feeding LTC from Pro Tools to the renderer? Uh, no, it's a workflow choice. Um, uh, I honestly prefer the Dolby Audio Bridge into the renderer versus the send and return plugins um, because delay compensation is preserved and, and things like that. Um, but uh, there are use cases that I found recently to uh, uh, to crash that back into um, uh, into Pro Tools for, for for good and valid reasons, um, which I won't go into now because it's way in excess of what we need to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in new, uh, I own Nuendo. Is there a difference between my panner and the one you showed us for music? I mean, uh, so the only difference uh, in the music panner for uh, for, for Nuendo, in fact, for any of the uh, platforms, is kind of that step sequencer. Um, so it's a creative choice. Uh, if you're creating static objects um, and building the, uh, or, or want to manually hand pan um, elements, then everything you want to achieve is achievable in the VST multi-panner in, uh, in Nuendo. Um, that's a really deep integration. Uh, but similar to the uh, to the conversation about the stereo uh, versus the mono object, be careful when you're working with the 5.0 and 7.0 capabilities, because the sensitivities to phase uh, relationships uh, might be something that you want to uh, uh, to carefully consider in uh, in that uh, in that VST multi-panner. Um, so uh, there we go. Um, is it possible to experience head tracking in an Atmos style playback system? Uh, well, technically, yes. Um, so what we what we've been used to is head locked audio, right? So if you uh, if you, you know, are sitting in your in your control room chair, um, the the sound field coming out from the speakers is the sound field coming out of the speakers. If you then turn for your chair, you're going to get the head tracking experience. Um, so yes, a spinning office chair and uh, a speaker-based playback is, uh, is is absolutely the best way to experience head-tracked audio uh, today. Um, and uh, I'm sure there will be developments there with the uh, uh, with, with the binaural capability at some point uh, in the future. But uh, uh, I don't have anything to, uh, to, to to hang a timeline on any of that stuff with. So. <clears throat> Um, do, do, do. Let me see. Uh, do you have to download all of the files that are connected to the trial for usage of Dolby Atmos? Um, I'm going to be absolutely and 100% honest with you, John. I have not gone through that link. I don't know what files are, are shared there. Um, but no, all you need is the renderer. 
um, and probably the, uh, the 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 Dolby Atmos Music Panner is going to be a really useful one to uh, to, to grab hold of as well. Um, so uh, I hope that that's uh, that's that's a good answer to your question, and uh, uh, you get where you need to be. So um, thank you all for for your time today. Uh, we're, we're we're at time, um, and I hope that I've answered as many of your questions as as possible. Uh, join me next week to uh, to dive in more. Uh, but uh, thank you for for taking the time and uh, for all of your wonderful questions. And I hope that uh, we're uh, we're going to be creating Dolby Atmos music here very very soon. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, producing Dolby Atmos music. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Dolby and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.